you can't pick up a newspaper without reading something about how digital technologies are transforming business models and unlocking massive market opportunities. We very quickly came to the conclusion that if we continued to operate in an analog manner, we were going to be irrelevant in a digital world. And so for us, what we're seeing is it's not time for a step change, but we're seeing big, big change for tax. And again, as we alluded to before, it's starting to unlock the value of professionals. And I'm not doing something that these folks have spent four to eight years of college to figure out how to do tax. Now they're applying that tax and being able to focus on the areas where we're in value. So we really see this as a period of uh, tax being reimagined. And it's not a scary thing, but a very exciting for us. And we went to Silicon Valley. We went all over the, the earth scouring for AI capability that would read a table and couldn't find it. But with a partner that we have established in our own journey, we are creating that capability. That will be something that can be transitioned to the entire marketplace. We're seeing exponential growth in the price and performance of computing, the ease of access to these technologies, and just the, you know, just the continual doubling and tripling of information that is uh, giving these technologies more and more power. The availability of data, machine-readable data, cheap computing, and AI is not only enabling the automation of work, but the augmentation of human decisions. In other words, it's making people smarter. Nobody, right, in the Fortune X, name what it is, has gone through a transition from an analog organization to a digitally transformed organization today. There is no coloring book. There is no roadmap. There is no industry that has successfully completed the mission. So we're all moving through, in some cases, uncharted territory. The, the value is shifting from just the core technology to the, to the trainers who are building these, or training these learning systems. So knowledge and expertise matter, point one. I mean, you can't build intelligent systems without that. And that's what our friends from KPMG bring. But if we look at things like natural language processing, uh, the use of ontology models or domain-specific vocabularies to extract data in context and use that in automation, uh, machine learning, much of this has, has come very, very far in a very rapid period of time. And if you incorporate these with RPA, then I, you really expand the art of the possible. We're no longer looking at the problem as this. We've kind of broken the problem down into a set of steps that really starts us to get on the path of automating. So we're not standing there with deer, like deer in headlights saying, where do I start? What do I do? What are you trying to solve? And then what do you think the data sources are that you need? And clean it that way. There is self-driving technology in lane departure warning, uh, the automatic brake controls. All the technology in automobiles today are just examples of incremental uses of that technology. There are a lot of smaller steps that you can take with AI, with the right kind of data, start automating before you get to this big bang of the whole thing is going to change. It's a combination of machines or cyber and human talent. And the more that we augment expertise, the more that we take the roboticism out of our people and allow our people to leverage cognitive skills to solve for problems, the more capital intensive we will be and the more important those machines, and by the way, data, will be to our industry. Even with great data and great uh, technology underpinning it, if you don't have the right domain expertise and technical expertise training those models and using that data and that technology and bringing it together, then you're not going to be able to deliver on the value either. The data that you use today to run your business may not be the data that you need to differentiate yourselves going forward, and it may not be the data you need to train the systems. Another thing that we've learned along the way is we firmly believe that AI isn't something you buy. It's something that you build. So if you think about um, the, the fantastic um, AI-type platforms and technologies out there, like those from IBM Watson, Azure Machine Learning, GCP, they're foundational building blocks. And when you treat them as a foundation, you have to bring in the bespoke domain expertise that understands 
how to connect th those technologies together, complemented by training and programming and open source, in order to create connected solutions that deliver on actual business problems. So the culture of the organization, you will only be able to deliver the transformation within your organization at the cultural speed of your organization. So you need to make that culture as, a, well, you need to make the program as efficient as possible, but you're never gonna go faster than your organization's culture will allow. So instead of thinking about what people are doing to manage people in a process in an analog world, think about what is the end goal you're trying to achieve? And how can you get that end goal with intelligent automation as an enabler as opposed to a people checking people or a sneaker network approach to getting something done? The technology conversations usually start with, could I automate this? But then as you move up to leadership, it's, well, should I automate this? What does this mean? 45% of my workforce or whatever that number is, what does that mean to my company? But what does that mean to society? How are we going to pivot our society to be able to have the workforce of the future match the jobs of the future? This, this, this workforce of the future is built on problem solving and creativity and innovation. For any of you that have children at school, in, uh, that there's probably a better than 50% chance that they're going to live to 100. Add to that the fact that there's an expectation that people entering the workforce now are going to have 10 careers, sometimes quite different careers. And of course, that means retraining, reskilling in the moment. And that, of course, is a facet of the gig economy, contingent working, and the fact that it's no longer, for many people, a permanent job. I think it's going to create more opportunity than it's going to displace significant amounts of our workforce. The discipline they have to really come with is the ability to learn how to learn and how to then harness these new tools to continue to differentiate themselves. I think one of the things some organizations in, in, in making that jump will underestimate is the creative and innovative power of their own organization. People try to redeploy people. There's a huge value in having employees and having them know your corporate culture um, and having having internal networks within your organization and being able to get things done. So you're not just going to necessarily get rid of 50% of your workforce, you're going to try to have them do other things. It's about matching people to the challenge and avoiding either having people doing work that's quite frankly beneath them or indeed putting them into positions that's way above their capability. So the good news here is that in fact past productivity is no indication of future productivity. I do think you know, workforce of the future, one, if you're a leader and a driver of that, it probably needs to start with you because it, it needs to be a, a openness to change. There needs to be a bit of humility in, in each of us when you're the driver of this. It requires the, the higher purpose conversation both in government and the C-suite. And the work starts now for many organizations considering this topic of workforce shaping. Otherwise, it'll just happen in an uncontrolled way, and you won't get where you want to be. Hopefully, this probably seems like common sense, but it's interesting to us how many times it's not done. Um, tying this kind of effort to whatever your business strategy is. Um, this life sciences client actually tied this to their credo, which is all about wow. patience and their people, right? Sort of um, does, does sort of like what Southwest does that says, you know, our, um, our passengers are only gonna be happy if our employees are happy. If you could teach a machine to do this boring work, you can free people up to prioritize issues, fix deficiencies, connect with customers and think and innovate, which is what people wanna do.